In this video, we're going to look at the CSEC January 2023 paper 3. So here I have my first question where we have the diagram below shows the front view of Pinky's house, which includes four windows and a door. So this will be the four windows here and this will be the door. We have the dimensions of the front view here and part A, part 1, is to calculate the total surface area of the front view of Pinky's house inclusive of the windows and door. So what we have here inclusive of the windows and door would be a triangle and a rectangle. So if I were to draw a line across like this, we could see that we're getting a triangle here, right? Triangle on top here and then below here would be a rectangle. So to find the area of a rectangle is simple. That's just length by breadth. And the area of a triangle is base by height over two or a half base by height. So let's do the area of the triangle first. So I'm gonna have area of triangle is equal to base by height over two. Now let's see what's the base and height of this triangle. Now the base and the height are always at right angles to each other. So this distance 3.4 would be the height because it has right angles to this distance here, which is the base. Now we don't have a measurement for this line here, but if we look down, this 30 meters would be the same as this distance across here. So the base of the triangle would be 30 meters. I'll just put that in. All right, so this is 30 meters here. And of course, our height is this 3.4 meters. All right, so I'll just put in the 3.4 meters here and I'll show you the right angle here. So you can see that the height and the base are at right angles to each other. So now we have all the information we need to work out the area of the triangle. So I'm gonna put the base is 13 times the height, which is 3.4, and I'm gonna divide that by two. So that will be equal to, and I can put that information into the calculator by simply putting 13 multiplied by 3.4, and let's put divided by two. I'm going to get 22.1. So I'm going to put 22.1 and that will be meters squared. So now that's the area of the triangle. Now let's find the area of the rectangle. So the area of the rectangle would be length by breadth. And the length would be the 30 meters and the width or breadth would be the 7.5 meters. So we're going to have 13 meters by 7.5 and that will be equal to 97.5 meters squared. So now that we have the area of the triangle and the area of the rectangle, we can just add them together and that'll be the total surface area of the front view inclusive of the windows and door. So I'll just put down here total surface area is equal to 22.1 plus 97.5. And that will give 119.6 meters squared. And this will be our answer for part A, part one. So now for part A, part two, we have the windows and door are made of shatterproof glass. The door is 1.2 meters wide and 2.8 meters high. So let's put in those dimensions. So we have the door is 1.2 meters wide. So that's 1.2 meters here and 2.8 meters high, so that's 2.8 meters here. So 2.8 meters here. Next we have each of the four windows is 1.8 meters wide and 1.4 meters high. So let's put any dimensions on one of the windows. So we have 1.8 meters wide. So I'll put the 1.8 meters wide here. And then we have 1.4 meters high. So we have the 1.4 meters here. All right, so 1.8 meters wide, 1.4 meters high. Now they want us to determine the minimum amount of glass needed for the door and the four windows. So remember they said that the windows and door are made of shatterproof glass. So the whole door is glass, the whole window is glass. So they want to know how much glass is needed for the four windows and the one door. So all we have to do is calculate the area of one window multiplied by four, and that will be the area of the four windows combined. Then we find the area of the door, and we'll add up all the areas, and that'll be the amount of glass that we need 
for the four windows and one door. Now both the windows and door are rectangles, so the area of a rectangle is length by breadth. So first I'll go with the area of a window. So I'll have the area of one window is equal to length by breadth, which is equal to 1.8 by 1.4, which is equal to 2.52 meters squared. So now I'll put the area of all four windows. So the area of four windows will be equal to this 2.52 multiplied by four. And that will be 10.08 meters squared. So now we have the area of all four windows as 10.08 meters squared. All we need to do now is find the area of the door and add it to the area of the four windows. And that'll be the total amount of glass needed for the four windows and one door. So the area of the door is equal to length by breadth again. And now the length is the 2.8 and the breadth is the 1.2. So that'll be 2.8 multiplied by 1.2 and that's equal to 3.36 meters squared so all we have to do now is add this 10.08 to this 3.36 and that will be the minimum amount of glass needed for the door and four windows so i'm going to put the minimum amount of glass needed is equal to 10.08 plus 3.36 which is equal to 13.44 meters squared all right so this is our answer for a part two now for a part three we have pinky covers the front of a house excluding the door and four windows with decorative tiles well decorative wall tiles calculate the area she covers with the tiles so all we have to do is take the area of the entire front view and subtract it from the area of the four windows and one door combined. So if you recall, if you go back here, the total surface area of the front view was 119.6. And the area of the four windows and one door was 13.44. So I'm gonna put area covered with tiles is equal to that 119.6, the total surface area. Take away the combined area of the four windows and one door, which is 13.44. And that will give 106.16 meters squared. And simple as that, that's your answer for A part three. So now let's move on to part B. So for part B, we have Pinky paints one of the walls of a house, which has an area of 53 meters squared. One liter of paint covers an area of 4.5 meters squared. Paint is sold in 2.5 liter tins, each costing $24.75. Pinky buys the least number of tins of paint needed to paint this wall. Calculate the cost of the paint required to paint the wall. So first we'll start with Pinky Paints one of the walls, which has an area of 53 meters squared. Now it's saying one liter of paint covers an area of 4.5 meters squared. So if we divide this 53 meters squared with this 4.5 meters squared, we'll find out how many liters of paint is required to paint this wall. So I'm gonna put paint required so paint wall is equal to 53 divided by 4.5. So that's equal to, so we have 53 divided by 4.5. And we get this answer that is not exact. So what we'll do is approximate this to three significant figures. So one, one, seven, stop with the seven, that's a third significant figure. After a seven is a seven, so the seven will go up by one and turn to eight. So 11.8 liters. So 11.8 liters. So now the next piece of information is that paint is sold in 2.5 liter tins. So if I divide this 11.8 by this 
I'll find out how many tins of paint are needed. So I'm going to put tins of paint required to paint wall is equal to that 11.8 divided by 2.5. So that'll be equal to. So we'd have 11.8 divided by 2.5. And that will be equal to 4.72. So that's 4.72 tins of paint. All right, so that's 4.72 tins. Now, obviously, you can't buy a fraction of a tin. So therefore, you'll need five tins in all. So it should be equal to five tins. All right, so you need five tins of paint. So now we know each tin of paint costs $24.75. So we just have to multiply this $24.75 by five, because five tins, and you get the cost of how much money she needs to buy the tins of paint. All right, so the cost of the paint is equal to $24.75. That's the cost of one tin times five tins we need, which is equal to, all right, so we have $24.75 multiplied by five, which is equal to $123.75. All right, so we have $123.75. And that will bring us to the end of question one. Now, in this paper three, we have two questions. So now for the second question. All right, so for the second question, we already seen that this is going to be a speed time graph. So let's read the information. Leah cycles along a path for five minutes. We can see our time down here is in seconds, so we'd have to convert this five minutes in terms of seconds. Now we know 60 seconds make up one minute. So five times 60 will give us how much seconds make up five minutes. We will call that as now. All right, so Leah cycles along a path for five minutes. She starts from rest, then accelerates as a constant rate until she reaches a speed of five meters per second. We have our speed on this axis here, so five meters per second will be up here. After 100 seconds, so they give us this um, in seconds here. Okay, so 100 seconds, that's here, 100 seconds. She continues cycling at 5 meters per second for 2 minutes. So again, we'll have to convert this minutes to seconds because our time here is in seconds. So 2 minutes and 40 seconds. Then she decelerates at a constant rate until she stops. Okay, on the grid below, draw the speed time graph to show Leah's journey. So first, let's convert these minutes to seconds. So I'm going to put 5 minutes is equal to 5 times 60 seconds. All right, and 5 by 6 is theta. I add a 0. So the entire journey will take 300 seconds. And we can see our graph goes all the way to 300 seconds. So we're expecting to stop at 300 seconds because that's the whole journey. Leah cycles along a path for five minutes. Five minutes is the entire journey, which is 300 seconds. And let's just do this two minutes and 40 seconds one time. All right, so two minutes is equal to two times 60 seconds. So two by six is 12. So that'd be 120 seconds. So two minutes and 40 seconds is equal to, let's add, add 40 to this 120, so that's 160. There's 160, well, that's basically the right seconds here, so that's by uh, seconds, okay? So 160 seconds. So we know this is 160 seconds, and this five minutes is 300 seconds. So what I'll do, I'll just put here 300 seconds, and there's two minutes and 40 seconds, that is 160 seconds. So now when we read any question, we can understand how to draw the graph. All right, so let's go. She starts from rest and accelerates at a constant rate. And well, we know in a speed time graph, acceleration would be, well, a constant acceleration would be a straight line. If it's a curve, the acceleration is changing. So constant acceleration, you know, it's got a straight line. So acceleration is constant until she reaches a speed of five meters per second after 100 seconds. So you come in here on 100 seconds, go all the way up to five, and this will be a point. So from this point, straight down to zero, you draw in a line. All right, so with 100 
going all the way up to five, that's going to plot this point here like this. And now I'm going from zero all the way up to that point. And that will be a constant acceleration to five meters per second for a hundred seconds. Now to say she continues cycling at five meters per second. So that means the speed remaining constant. So you know that's a horizontal line going along five meters per second. That's constant speed for two minutes and 40 seconds. And we do this 160 seconds. So from this 100, it's going to be a horizontal line for the constant speed. And you're going to go at additional 160 seconds. So that's 160 plus this 100 is 260. So that means you're going to stop here. So I'm coming all the way up from 260, all the way up to five meters per second and plot this point. All right, so from here to here would be the additional 160 seconds. So I draw a line coming straight across like that and that's our constant speed. Now to say she decelerates at a constant rate. Now, the thing about a speed time graph, acceleration is a positive um, gradient. So the gradient of this line is positive. That's acceleration. Now, deceleration has a negative gradient, which means the line has to be coming down. Now, you're probably wondering, well, how to know how far to bring the line in terms of the arm time? Well, you know, the entire journey is 300 seconds. So you must end at 300 seconds. So if you're going to decelerate and come to a stop, you're going to decelerate from this point here and come all the way down to 300 seconds. So you're going to draw a line from this point, come all the way down to 300 seconds to end the journey. And that's your deceleration. Now, for part two of this question, they want us to determine Leah's acceleration. So I need to go back to the graph that I drew and know this part here is for the acceleration and the acceleration on a speed time graph is equal to the gradient of the line. So all we have to do is just work out the gradient of this line here. So, you know, that's the change in Y over the change in X. So I'm going to put acceleration is equal to, I'm going to put the change in Y, which is the change in speed. So I'm going to put change in S over the change in x, which is your time axis. So the speed is the y-axis. So, you know, it's changing y over changing x. So y-axis is speed and the x-axis is time. So I'm going to have change in time. So that's equal to. Now the portion of the graph you'll be looking at would be here. All right, so this vertical line will represent our change in speed. I'm going from zero to five right zero to five that's our change in speed so i'm going to put my change in speed is equal to five all right and my change in time would be from zero to 100 so my change in time is equal to 100 all right so from zero to five the change is five and from zero to 100 the change is just 100 so my change in speed is 5 and my change in time is 100. So that's how to divide that 5 divided by 100. All right, so that's how I put 5 divided by 100. I'm going to get 0 0.05 and that would be my acceleration in meters per second squared. All right, so I have 0 0.05 and that's meters per second squared, the unit for acceleration. Now for part three of this question, they want us to calculate Leah's average speed for the entire journey. Now, the average speed is the total distance over the total time taken. Now, we know the total time taken is 300 seconds. But the total distance, how are we going to get that? Because this is a speed here and this is time. Well, we know the area under your speed time graph is equal to distance. So what we have to do is find the area of this trapezium here. Well, of course, the shape is a trapezium. All right, so we know the area of a trapezium is a half, the sum of the two parallel sides. So that'll be here and here, multiplied by the height, and the height would be five. So I'm going to just put this on my parallel side. This as my next parallel side. Of course, if you remember, this was um, 160 seconds. So from 100 to 260, that would be 160. So this here is 160. Right, of course, seconds. And down here, where we could see what's going on down here, this is a total of 300. So I'm still going to put here is 300. So that's our parallel sides. And now for the height, we have a height going up to 5. So I'm just going to put the height here is 5. 
I'm going to show that this is um, at right angles to the parallel sides. Okay, so we've seen plainly we have a trapezium. The parallel sides are 160 and 300, and the height is 5. So I'm going to have area of trapezium is equal to half the sum of the two parallel sides, which will be 160 plus 300 multiplied by the height, and the height is 5. So that'll be equal to. Okay, let's work that out straight on the calculator. I mean, a half is 0.5, but if you use a fraction button and put 1 over 2 like that, open brackets, 160 plus 300, close the brackets, and then multiply that by 5. Press equal, and we get 1,150. So we're going to write 1,150. And for this, I'll just put unit squared. All right, but now we know the area under the curve is equal to the distance. And if you look at this, time is in seconds and speed is in meters per second. So time is in seconds and this meters will represent the distance. So our distance is in meters. So I'm going to put total distance is equal to 1,150 meters. All right, so let's remember that the distance is the area under the graph. And now our total time taken will be 300 seconds. So our average speed is equal to total distance. And I put the IST for distance over total time taken. So that would be equal to 1,150 divided by 300 seconds. So that would be equal to 1,150 divided by 300. So this is going to give an answer that's not exact. So we're going to approximate that to three significant figures. So 1, 2, 3. Stop at this 3 here. After is a 3, so this 3 remains the same. So 3.83. So 3 .83 and that'll be meters per second. All right, because speed was in meters per second, and this is just the average speed. So 3.83 meters per second. So for question two, part B, we have the diagram below shows the graph of three lines, L1, L2, and L3. So that's L1 here, L2 here, and L3 here. And the shaded region R, which is this, which represents the common region for the three inequalities associated with the lines L1, L2, and L3 that define R. All right, so this diagram is the diagram that I'm talking about here. Now the table below shows some of the inequalities of the lines L1, L2, and L3. So that's this table down here and the respective inequalities that define the shaded region R. Now what I want us to do is to copy the table above by inserting the missing information. So you just have to put in the missing information on the table. Can remember you're writing on the question paper, so you just have to put in the information that's missing. So for L1, we have y is equal to 2x. So I'll just shade this in green. And I'll draw L1 in green here. And write this is y is equal to 2x. Then we have L2 is y is equal to 2. So obviously I shade that in brown. So I'm going to find L2, which is here, and draw a line in brown like this. And this is y is equal to 2. And then we have L3, I shade in blue. We have this piece here missing, but we have 2y is less than or equal to 10 take away x. So I'm just going to put the line for L3 in blue here. And I write in the equation after. So now, looking at the line L1, which is in the one in green, so if you remember linear programming or your graph for inequalities, I mean, just use the angles. So if the line form an acute angle with the x-axis, that's less than, and the obtuse angle, remember the obtuse angle not going to stop here, right? It's going to go all the way around to the x-axis. So on this side is the obtuse angle of this green line. So the obtuse angle is more than, and the acute angle is less than. Or if you look at it any format, uh, if you're going up is more than, and if you're coming down is less than. I like to look at it like that. So always make sure that Y is the subject of the formula. So 
all of them y is the subject so even though here is 2y at least is 2y is less than or equal to something so once you have something with y one term with y is equal to something that's good to go i know it's the inequality sign here but we're looking at it in the form as equal to all right so going up is more coming down is less so if you look at the green line coming down why is this object of the formula so coming down the shaded region is below the line so that's less than so you're gonna have y is less than 2x all right so i'm gonna write here y is less than so i'll put it equal to and 2x and as simple as that so if you're gonna look for the one in brown now y is equal to 2 Again, y is the subject of the formula, so y is equal to 2. So above is more, below is less. So it's kind of brown line. So the shading what? Above the line. So that's more than. And since the shading touching the line, more than or equal to. So we're just going to have y is more than or equal to 2. So which brings us to this one. All right, we have 2y is less than or equal to 10 take away x. That's the line in blue. So if you carry line in blue, the shading is below the line. So that's correct, less than or equal to because the shading is below the line in blue. So this line in blue is simply 2y is equal to 10 take away x. So all I'm writing here is 2y is equal to 10 take away x. And that will bring us to the end of this past paper. And that will be it for this video.